So, um, welcome to the 104th Airhex TV, uh, November edition. And uh, with lots of questions, not that many questions from the audience, or uh, actually a uh, lot of questions from the audience, but not from the gist, which is uh, remarkable. So, um, so let's start with the show. So, let's start with the very first interesting part. I have to find the gist. Okay, here is it. I make it a little bit larger. And um, what happened? So, uh, there is a nice guy called Lenny Primak. And this is, he's a fine guy, really, really nice. Uh, the only problem with him is he, he, he likes Lombok, right? But um, no, nobody is perfect. But um, what happened? So, <laughs> the last time I explained uh, the uh, clustered annotation, and um, someone asked me, you know, uh, what my opinion about the clustered annotation is. And what I explained to you, that the Payara clustered annotation works as uh, similar to JBoss HR Singleton, which works that way that there is a master and all these slaves are waiting until, until the master dies. And this is not true. So uh, Lenny uh, pink, pinged me on Twitter and said, hey, Adam, let's see, maybe it is even working. Lenny, as the author of uh, Cluster, said, okay, does, uh, it was not tr true what I said. I said, okay, Lenny, uh, then what we should do is we should record a podcast. And he, I rearranged the entire podcast queue, and this podcast is already published. And this is the episode, episode 213, Captain Premac meets Clustered and uh, Singletons. And we discuss actually, I, I hope so, um, I would say 80% of the episode exact the issue. So how Payara clustering is working, it uses Hazelcast, Hazelcast behind the scenes, and there is no a single HR singleton, and the entire state of the singleton is managed by Hazelcast. It's not like, you know, there could, can be only one. It's more like the state of the singleton is synchronized with Hazelcast. So this was the topic number one. I think this is an interesting episode, so go listen to it. And you will also learn, you know, the difference between the largest Boeing and uh, smallest Cessna. So Delaney was, uh, is, is a pilot, and he really enjoys uh, small airplanes right now. And he also flew the, 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 the big ones. And yeah, so this was maybe interesting to you. And um, so what we also did, an interesting episode, because someone asked in the chat, uh, what about Java 19 and reactive programming? And exactly about that, there was an episode with Daniel Katz of Helidon. He spends uh, now a um, major of his uh, working time with uh, Project Loom and reactive programming. So if you're interested in this, listen to this episode. And the last episode was fun <laughs> because um, someone mentioned Heinz on Twitter, that the Heinz Kabutz is the Java guy. And uh, I, I made fun and said, okay, uh, Heinz has nothing to do with Java, but he's a professional snooker player, which, which is true. I mean, he, he likes snooker. And so we, we started with this in the podcast. So if you like Heinz and performance Java, listen to it. So we talk mostly about uh, parallelism, concurrency, and deadlocks. So this is um, also news. Before we start with the time machine, uh, something interesting happens as well. So first, um, there is a... Okay, I was invited to Star of Java. It's an Indian conference. And um, oh, funny, funny thing, actually. And they asked me about a topic. It's okay, serverless is actually what I'm doing everywhere. Maybe I should do something with serverless. And I say, yeah, but serverless uh, is uh, not uh, a little bit more Java. So then I suggested another topic. And then, you know, something happened because what they did, they took <laughs> the title from one session and the abstract for another. So, um, and it was already announced. And they say, hey, we cannot just cancel this. Uh, could you please... <laughs> deliver a, a, a session about two topics at once. So I did it, and uh, I recorded also for myself, because there's something you know happens, I can send them the, the recordings. Um, and, and then I wanted to delete the, the recordings, and before I say, okay, why not just to publish it? And I published the session, and it is actually fairly well received, so I got you know, lots of likes and, um, and lots of comments, or a, a few comments, and there's already 1K views, for Java topic, not bad. There, there are no cats involved, you know, no beauty topics. It's just 
just Java. So if you like, watch this. I would say more interesting is, um, also happened in October. So there's another session. So actually two sessions. So one, there's there was a JDD conference. I mentioned this, I mentioned this already several times, but this is because interesting one, because they invited me, I think... What, what I found, uh, the first time, I think they in, invited me in 2008. But then um, in 2011 was the next time. And in 2011, I delivered a talk. Java 6 is not evenly distributed yet. Oh, no, Java 6. <laughs> yeah, this is also true. But uh, it was the future is not Java 6 and the future is the future is now and is not evenly distributed yet. I think something like this. But what I said is Java 6 is the future. And, um, okay. Uh, and um, so this was in 2012 to 2011, and ten years um, ten years later they invited me again, and I remember them, and I said, okay, why not you know listen to myself? I did it the very first time, what I said actually, and, and see whether it is actually true after ten years. And what I also did, I found the source code in a universe.zip because the tagline of the conference is. Uh, sent, uh, something, let's build Java universe together. I think something like this. So I found the source code and I dig, and uh, so I then promised the attendees at the conference, you know, to, to live migrate the app, which, but we didn't have enough time to it. I got too many questions and we spent more time on serverless again. So I promised them to record a session and this session was published today. And uh, this is 10 years after from Java 6, to, uh, yeah, and AWS Lambda. This is unfortunate because it should be a surprise. So what I did is the entire time I migrated the old uh, Java 6 and Java 6 application to MicroProfile. And in the end, I, I uh, with minor modifications, means deleting lots of classes, I pushed that to uh, as AWS Lambda, a MicroProfile app. So this is fairly new, already well received because it is... Um, uh, how old is it? Like 10, 10 hours and has 32 likes. So I would say, thank you for the likes. I really like likes. So um, uh, because uh, it, it says, okay, I'm not crazy. Someone so, someone, someone likes that. Okay. This were the two, I would say, more interesting topics. Um, and uh, I think now back to the show. And thank you, Lenny, for spending time with me and clarifying the cluster annotation. I hope you know that the Lenny will adjust the implementation to my explanation, but Lenny, Lenny was against it. So uh, Lenny said, okay, we should you know, correct my explanation because he, he has no time to change the code. So what we can do, right? Okay. Cool. So we covered uh, one, one topic. And now, oh, uh, what I also do, I, I recorded, I think already 30 shorts and they also were received, and the shorts are really cool because it's like you know they they had they only can be one minute, and I uh, so I can just do you know trivial stuff. Whatever I get a question, I record a short, or w w when I do something more or less interesting in project, for instance, recently um, I managed to use replace all, and I only saw underscores. Like why this, and just recorded a shot about that. So um, if you like, watch the shorts, and if you have questions in between, maybe I be I answer the questions with a short. Okay. Then, <clears throat> okay, another piece of history. You have to listen to the episode with Hertian Vilenga. Because what happened, uh, when was it? 2009. So I was part of the, or, or there was a NetBeans World Tour, and I was invited by Sun. So I traveled uh, from, from Krakow to Gdańsk, and uh, in a car with Sun guys, and... Uh, and uh, presented some topics, I guess, Java. -y. <laughs> and then um, on the way back, they attended a Java user group in Katowice. But I I had no time back then, so I traveled back to buy projects. But uh, I was in Krakow conference, JDD, what I mentioned earlier, and this conference was sponsored, or or at least it was mentioned, the you know Java user group. So I remember that, so it's okay. I ping them and say, hey, look, I, I'm, you know, in the area anyway. So if you like, I deliver another talk just for you. And it was actually a great thing because it was actually in a company which uh, which um, manages um, Apple devices. So it was also a really nice place. And it spent, I don't know, three hours discussing um, serverless Java again. Got lots of questions. It was a lot of fun. And the organizer of the, uh, of the, this was crazy. So I, I think we ended at 9 or 10 p.m. 
And uh, next morning at six, there was the first question. And so I catch the questions, and this is the question here. And uh, the organizer asked, asked me, what if a Lambda needs to call an external API and wait for reply? Should we just block it? And um, I mean the case when user waits for the response. So and my answer is there are two, two categories of Lambdas. One is the synchronous, and the other one is the asynchronous. And the uh, asynchronous lambda is this: what is what? How lambda is was meant, you know, to to work. So it it waits for external events. But this is usually what what we are not doing in projects, because I mostly misuse AWS Lambda as a cheaper way to run, you know, container apps more or less. And um, so in this particular case, means I'm running AWS Lambda as uh, as uh, as a Java e server almost, then we are absolutely waiting for uh, for the user. So if I call you know a database and the database uh, takes ten seconds, so we will wait for ten seconds. This is this can be problematic because it will work. The problem is the longer you wait, the most the more expensive the lambda gets. In one point of time, maybe it is not worth running lambda, and maybe a a, a Fargate, for instance. Um, uh, is would be a cheaper alternative, not better rather than cheaper. It's all about economics. I would say most architectural decision in the cloud has nothing to do, you know, with technology and have a lot to do with the invoice. Okay, I, I hope. Um, so, and if this were the asynchronous Lambda, so the uh, the proper way would be fire and forget. So you're sending something to the database, the database changes the state, and then uh, the state causes another event and is consumed usually by another lambda. This would be, you know, the beautiful flow. And uh, my flows are uglier but simpler. It means we have, you know, something which waits for HTTP. And um, for um, yeah, this is what it is. So let's see where is my chat. Wow, cool. Um, cheers from Brazil from Tiago. Okay, uh, how late is in Brazil? The question, you know, to the uh, to the entities. Oh, by the way, on Twitter, Global Homo Enthusiast said, Adam, please use a high res picture. And it says, Adam Bini, what is it? Explain yourself. So this was a uh, today has nothing to do with air hacks. And, and he's, um, this was just my avatar from YouTube. And I should explain what it is. So um, I can tell you what it is. It was a nice guy at Sun Microsystem, and the, the name of the guy was Aaron Houston. And he took the image from Java One. It's really hard for me to take images from myself. And this was the, I think, one of the last Java ones from Sun Microsystems. So um, I did, um, I, I like the picture because it was you not know, the old Java logo with me. And I'm pixelated because I'm pixelated. I say it's a great profile photo because no one actually cares if it's a small photo. It's still, you know, Java is recognizable and everyone will believe that's me, right? So I look, of course, now a way better than, you know, 14 years ago. But uh, this is actually the explanation. So Global Home Enthusiast, unfortunately, I don't think I will change the the profile in my profile image and i would say it is better you know that you can <laughs> recognize the the letters in my screencast before you recognize you know my head here in in the avatar ah see, uh, 4 p.m in brazil not bad <laughs> oh tiago liamo is interesting uh, um he's traveling on ahex tv so he rewatches all the episodes i think it's called binging right so if if i had netflix is what usually happens i will have to rewatch all these seasons uh, or all the episodes so tiago i have a job for you and uh, i will send you a t-shirt maybe i have a mark and t-shirt and marks the whole package so um your job is to find inconsistencies so what i said you know 10 years ago and I say something different right now, and you can file a new question or say, Adam, you said something back then this way, and now you change your mind. Why? And um, and I will try to explain it. So this 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 is the deal, Tiago. So now you have the job, if you like. Okay, cool. And Luca, hi. So I think we should uh, follow the the questions. Otherwise, there will be ah. Let's start with the time machine. This is now the time machine show, so I can close that. And this was, these are the questions from 2014, July, and that's exactly 100 episodes ago. And uh, the first question is already interesting. Are vanilla Java applications actually viable? Uh, 
the question is still R. Uh, so actually, it was the topic of the JDD conference. It is actually older than this. And what I did, I migrated a vanilla Java E application to AWS Lambda with minor modifications. So I would say the absolutely right choice, right? Show me other, you know, frameworks, whatever, which didn't change in 10 years are still viable. And people can say, you know, well, but, uh, you know, there is no innovation or whatever. But I would say, if you take a look, you know, at the Java E spec, there's like, Add inject for inject, right? Get for HTTP. So the question is, why we should change that? So why we should rename add inject to something different just to be different, right? So if, if th there, there is no changes in the concept, Java E can be you no know, unchanged viable for the next 15 years. And sometimes, uh, for instance, reactive programming took off, but we got Project Loom. So and Project Loom will make reactive programming for scalability obsolete, I would say. And um, the remaining cases, like, you know, which are obvious, like, you know, cons you know, reacting to events like Kafka events or Kinesis events or something like this. So this makes sense for reactive programming. But, you know, simplicity, I would say, wins in longer term. Okay, the next one is also interesting. Question number two, 10 years ago. What about exposing DB objects via REST directly? So, and uh, my answer hopefully didn't change. Um, it's always, you know, why not? I mean, in current project, we're also doing this. So why you should, you know, copy copy an object with the hope that it's somehow encapsulated? Um, I would write better tests or try to, you know, recognize it uh, differently. But um, yeah. Okay, I hope. So I hope um, it's clear. Then uh, question number three. The question is, there are lots of applications. How to deal with shared code? And I would say, uh, don't start with jar. I will copy the source code first. And this is also a, a discussion point with uh, Lenny, because he said, I have to be careful what I'm saying, because I you know it's not like copying code is the best, best practice. It is like, you know, pragmatic evil, I would say, copying code. Um, and, um, and copy the code first and see how it evolves. And you can decide, you know, maybe it is a bad idea you know, to have multiple microservices and uh, you can merge them together to a monolith. So, yeah, but this was different context. And don't name your modules util because uh, util means uh, nothing. So that's, that's the problem. So then another question, what is the best way to implement my own data source? So I think it's no more necessary. So, uh, but back then, you're right, you will have to implement a kind of a JNDI object. Then... Um, the question is, you know, how do I solve bootstrap passwords? Uh, also interesting because it's, uh, it changed a little bit, right? So um, if you take a look at Helidon Quarkus, usually the passwords are externalized and they are injected uh, by um, by uh, Fargate and recently also AWS Lambda got uh, secret um, support. So what it means is uh, encrypted passwords are injected to uh, to Quarkus, so there is no need for salt. This happens uh, somewhere else. So BCE back then. So I actually, it's interesting. I will have to look up when I started with the BCE pattern because now it is already you know nine, nine years a boundary control entity. And there's already a question. There are registrations, registration resource, resource resource uh, is the protocol adapter. Absolute true. But is it necessary to be an EGB? And uh, my answer is, it's not necessary, but it's easy. And right now, you know, in Quarkus, we don't have EGB, but at the resource level, we do the same. I, it's still transactional and application scoped or request scoped. So this is almost like an EGB. Um, so also funny, right? There was a, a huge drama, drama about EGBs, and now, you know, Quarkus doesn't have uh, EGBs, and this is like, you know, uh, no issue or uh, no show, because uh, what we are doing, we are just replacing at stateless with a stereotype, and we call it boundary. And uh, the stereotypes ships with request scoped and transactional, and it behaves almost like an EGB. A little bit slower, but yeah, uh, behaves very similar. <clears throat> okay. Uncertain future of Glassfish. The cool story is Glassfish, now there is a reboot of Glassfish. And um, uh, there is a small team which, uh, with uh, prior Glassfish uh, committers, which uh, try to make Glassfish uh, commercially viable again. Uh, I think it's called Omnifish. Wait a second. Omnifish. Yes, you can see. So uh, after Omnifish, uh, nice guys. Uh, if, if if you're running Glassfish, you can you can check them. So they're they're also running uh, Piranha Cloud. So there are you know 
uh, Glassfish and Jakarta eXpress. So you can see uh, the future of uh, Glassfish um, is actually there. And uh, the Super Glassfish is Payara, of course. Um, so th th there's actually competition even happened. So um, you see, we discussed a lot 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure that the project from Jurgen is, is no more, or pretty sure, maybe the project from Jurgen is no more you know, in production. And if you will stick with gla Glassfish, you could migrate to Payara or to Omnifish or whatever you like. So equals, no, don't override it. There's a lot of questions about GSF uh, with PWS, uh, PWA and the responsive web design. So um, I would say, so uh, I don't like, you know, to cover this question because GSF is less popular, but um, I would say GSF is still viable. So you could be very, very uh, productive and um, successful with GSF today. The only challenge with GSF is GSF is stateful. And if you're running in the cloud, you will have to configure the load balancer which can be challenging. We spent already, I would say, sometimes more time you know, fighting with the infrastructure than with the source code. So this is the only downside of GSF. But other than that, GSF were great. And still, you know, if you use something like the, um, uh, how it's called, um, prime faces, I wanted to say ice faces, uh, prime faces, they are still working perfectly. Um, so JustPick, uh, also interesting. Um, uh, actually, it's viable topics, right? Uh, JustPick was like internal security. I would say this uh, internal security, uh, whether it is Java 8 security or JustPick, which is um, what J JustPick is still around. It was wrapped with Java E security, which is Java 8 security, which is um, now, of course, Jakarta E security, which is easier to use. But in the cloud, security happens elsewhere, I would say usually by um, load balancers or HTTP API gateways. They usually do the OpenID Connect flow and uh, they create the JSON web token and this token is injected into Quarkus. Concurrency logs, maybe I'll record a shot about that. There is um, thread MXBean and it detects actually deadlocks. And, um, and of course, use Java Mission Control. It's a great, great tool. So JavaFX, uh, don't like to cover this right now. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Number 15. We do it ex exactly. Uh, we had the problem uh, recently. How do you know handle upload? And um, I refer to cloud. If you are in the cloud, I wouldn't use multi-part upload to upload something large. I would directly upload to S3 or um, how it's called blobs on uh, Azure storage. And uh, because um, yeah, they handle better than upload than we can actually handle in Kubernetes. And if you are on premise, then just you know upload directly to Kubernetes. No one cares about that. In the cloud, it's just too expensive, and um, there is a cheaper and better way and faster way to directly upload to S3. S3 will trigger an, an event. This event would be uh, consumed by Lambda. Lambda gets the name of the object, and then you have your file. And the 16, why Maven life lifecycle hooks are problematic? Um, I don't know why Michael T asked me about that, but uh, what I can imagine, what I said is that the Maven should be a simple build and the entire flow has to be performed in the pipeline. This is still my opinion. So what what I find fascinating that the, you know, eight years old questions are still up to date. So I get almost identical question today. So I think it's a good idea, uh, you know, to, to discuss the ancient history because, you know, the, the, the question the happens now this, again, right? Okay, so close that. Omnifish, if you need to know Jakarta experts, hire them. They are really committers. Um, so we have this. And, of course, uh, if you need the ultimate server, this is the uh, Payara fish. Uh, these guys actually make Glassfish viable, I have to say. What they did is, you know, they took over the entire Glassfish um, code base, improve that and uh, and make a great server out of that. So I would say kudos to Payara. So they were the pioneers. Um, so great company. And Lenny also worked for Payara and now he is a pilot, right? And he likes Lombok, I just want to mention. So um, nothing against Lombok, but so um, let's see. Okay, now question number two. I'm moving from Payara to Quarkus and can make sense of C CXF plugin for Quarkus. I think you mean CXF um, extension. 
And I don't know why you mentioned this CXF, because usually you would use REST Easy in Quarkus, not CXF. So um, th this is why I don't know why you're using CXF. So what I think, what you need is REST Easy. And uh, it ships already with Quarkus. I think if you do nothing, you just create with Quarkus CLI a Quarkus project. So look at my shorts. So I did it. So um, then you get already JaxRS set up. So there is one huge difference between Glassfish, which uses REST Easy, and Quarkus uh, uh, Glassfish, which uses, which uses Jersey. Glassfish Payara uses Jersey, Whitefly, and uh, and Quarkus are using REST Easy. So in uh, Glassfish and Pyra, you actually don't have to close the responses, or at least I didn't recognize any problems not closing them. What happens in Quarkus and Whitefly, if you don't close the responses from, a, let's say, an MP REST client, then it will block. So uh, you will see first uh, errors. Uh, I actually um, commented, um, write a post on my blog about that, that uh, Quarkus is closing the connection for you, and then it will just stop. So this is the main difference. So I don't don't use CXF plugin for Quarkus. I never use that. Great question. Would you would you like to include to your projects? Uh, do, to, would you would you include a dependency to your project even if you only need a small portion of functionality or a dev copy the single function on your own? So cool story. In one project, I told the developers, we are dependency free, don't use external dependencies. So okay, and what they did, they copied the source code of the external dependency. So um, for instance, check, the concrete example, Jakarta Commons Lang. Um, so in some projects, the developer just used, you know, is blank and uh, is empty and collections is empty. And I told them, is it really worth, you know, to, to include the entire library? Because this is so trivial. We just write one class with, you know, is blank and is not blank. And they did. There was like, you know, I don't know, 50 lines of code and problem solved. Um, what I what I did recently, I took a look at um, what I wanted to do is to, uh, just to remove EXIF from JPEGs with Java. And there is an EXIF library from Jakarta Commons. And I actually only need one method. So what I will do is I will take a look at the source code of the EXIF briefly and see is it really worth now you no know, to include the entire library or it is very easy to implement it by myself and uh, what I have to mention at this point you are actually not always allowed to copy the source code to your to your code because it really depends on the license so you should never do this with GPL and even if you're using Apache I think you have to to to, to have the attribution so it's not as easy so I would I will ask your lawyer about that. Um, so two related questions. Java releases now seem to have the te uh, the the, uh, the tendency to add more and more syntax sh sugar on the language. And the question is, um, is it uh, okay or is it uh, uh, unaccessible for inexperienced developers? Uh, I would say it. Uh, so if you are in a Java project, I would say what what the the culture should be to write simple code. So I wouldn't exaggerate, you know, with uh, just, you know, with generics or whatever patterns you have just to show off that you actually know the entire Java syntax. You can still write simple code. And um, I ha I would say we have to evolve. Otherwise, uh, you know, the youngsters won't use Java. They will say, okay, I don't like Java because we have in, I don't know, in Erlang, whatever, this and this functionality, and uh, so I will never start with Java. So it's not about, you know, the already um, old developers. So there are actually some developers which are older than 20. So something like this uh, can happen. And um, these developers, you know, try to write, you know, the old uh, syntax and uh, the youngsters, you know, which are younger than 20, they would like to have to do to, to later stuff. So I would say um, it is a good thing I like var. I don't use modules because I don't need them. I was I use records all the time. Uh, I use a switch expression, and um, I would say it is um, you just write less code without you know frameworks, and uh, it's a huge difference. And uh, you know to learn records and and var is very simple. To learn modules without a reason is harder. If you have the problem with modularity, then modules solve it no better than, I have to say, we had some, some episodes of AirHex with uh, OSGI chair, but I would say modules are easier than OSGI. So hopefully Jürgen Albert won't listen to this, but uh, this is what I can tell you. 
if you will notice that, uh, we, we need to record another podcast. <laughs> okay, now, recent Java additions, Offi memory, um, seem to offer memory management outside the GC and vendor-specific instruction set. And uh, he asked, um, do you think it will introduce new complexity for JDK GC developers to introduce improvements since those features are outside the range of uh, managed environment? So um, actually, memory map buffer, I think, was um, actually the trick from uh, all the NoSQL databases to be able to have large large chunks of memory outside of the heap. So this is, was reality for years. And with the uh, off-heap memory in, in recent addition, it is getting to be more manageable and simpler. I say, so my impression or my personal opinion is, it's a very good thing because it will simplify, you know, the interaction with external libraries. And I would say Java should improve the GNI and the all interaction because, you know, we need a good access to J, J, JPUs, uh, GPUs, <laughs> not J, it's not Java processing unit, it's just graphical GPUs. And um, and uh, interaction with C, Rust, and why not? And uh, also very important, you know, uh, why not to generate, you know, to compile Java into Vasm, for instance, gets more and more important. Okay, thank you. This was the clarification with Lenny. And now, old friend of the show, or young friend of the show, which uh, listens a long time to the show, ask me, do you use AWS SDK clients? When you want to access AWS services, S3 Dynamo, if not, how you create the request, uh, JSON, I think, this is the question, and how you do the authentication. Okay, uh, this is crystal clear. I always use the AWS SDK. For, for me, the AWS SDK is the standard, like Java E. Um, I don't use, for instance, Quarkus, Quarkified SDKs from Amazon. Um, I use, uh, why not? Because um, there is an unnecessary dependency on Quarkus because Quarkus will have then to keep, you know, the AWS dependencies up to date. So in all my project, I use the direct dependencies, the direct SDKs from AWS and it works really well. And um, so S3 DynamoDB, I tend to use the, uh, on the there, I think there are three. There's very low level. There is just like, you know, uh, a little bit higher level, and the highest DynamoDB level looks like JPA almost. I never use the JPA part, but I use the middle level, um, SDK. And we should not confuse SDK with CDK. So what you, you usually see on the screencast, CDK, this is where I use Java to deploy, you know, to provision the entire infrastructure. So what I, what I have to tell you, uh, what we do with AWS, we actually describe the entire infrastructure with Java code and we manage the Java code with Maven and we store it in Maven repository so we can reuse the, and we have a kind of a builder pattern so we can very quickly create the entire infrastructure with all the best practices and conventions. So, so you know, maybe the BCE, boundary control entities, so we say, okay, we have component with a business name and uh, we have a microservice or a service with a business name, and this is the same true for CDK. So if I know the name of the service, then I know you know which uh, um, CloudWatch log group it is, then uh, I know what the name of the load balancer, security group, and everything. So this is conventional of a configuration to the extreme. Okay, uh, thank you. And by the way, Alexander Spakovsky, I mentioned him several times, he wrote a book about Spring, and now he does Micronaut, and I guess maybe a little bit Quarkus. Um, who knows? Okay, I think we are done, which is amazing. Um, what I probably only forgot. Ah, two things. I created another project, and I also create a screencast. It's AWS Java Functional URL, URL CDK Plane. And I actually only created this to explain in a conference session, what actually happens behind the scenes with the serverless Quarkus stuff. So what this does is, um, let's see, there is the Lambda, it's just a Pojo, has nothing to do with Quarkus. It's called HTTP Listener, and it receives the uh, API Gateway v2 HTTP event, and I get access to the HTTP method headers and could do, you know, like Java programming in 1995, <laughs> serverless. And um, so, but this is maybe the, the, the fastest and leanest way to implement, uh, to, to react to HTTP events. And um, yeah, and maybe I will record a screencast 
and um, I use it for proof of concepts and uh, and usually I use Quarkus. And the difference to the Quarkus AWS Lambda is that the Quarkus, we can use MicroProfile or Java E. Okay, and there are two workshops on the horizon. The first one is serverless event-driven architecture with serverless Java. So it means, um, yeah, we use, you know, event-driven architecture, which are serverless with serverless Java. So there will be uh, just Fargate and AWS Lambda in Java side and serverless event-driven architectures means we will use, you know, Kinesis, maybe serverless Kafka, but Kinesis for sure, SQS, SNS, S3, how to re react to events. And the next one is serverless persistence for serverless Java and AWS. Why you no know, this one? Well, because there are specific, you know, or particular challenges, you know, um, how to manage connection pools, how to do security with lambdas. Then um, should we use, you know, the relational database or should we use DynamoDB or S3s or some discussion? And can we use Kinesis for persistent streaming uh, or, or, or event sourcing and uh, stuff like that? Okay. Let's take a look at, oh, wow. So we have a lots of questions here. So Paraguay, Carlos, welcome. So Jans Kunzmann sagt, the question is, is you remember the component model at large Bavarian automotive company? Uh, regarding BCE, yes, I remember this, but BCE is older than the Bavarian company. So uh, way older. So the boundary control entity is actually from, I think, Ivo Jacobson and is older than UML. And the uh, Bavarian Automotive Company, they had their own names. And I don't like, you know, own names. So the story is <laughs> there was a period of time where I had no, you know, how, how to call it, internal peer. And then I renamed it with boundary control entity. And then it was... Now it's standard. And back then they had their own names, which is always problematic because we had all we only had to we always had to explain, you know, why the name is different. So okay, there's some insider. There is a simple way to catch a request and redirect to another host. Filter could is there a simple way to catch a request and redirect it to another host? Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of I mean I would use a redirect, maybe. So if you search for and I'm being redirect JaxRS, I actually wrote even blog posts about that. Yeah. So there is a 301, 302, 307, 308. So this is an old one, old post. How old is it? Yeah, no, not that old. Two years. Uh, two and a half years. And uh, so this would be the best. And uh, you can use... Uh, a request filter in servlets and I think it's called container request filter in JaxRS as well or use redirects so this is what you could do 308 I think this is what you mentioned right 308 yes WM you're right you are you know your your answers are the shortest very good um a soap extensions okay uh I have no idea about, I never tried SOAP in Quarkus. Maybe we will have to do it soon, but until now, I never used SOAP. Actually, the last time I used SOAP, I am pretty sure it was around 2010 or even, 10 or even earlier. Um, yeah. Alex, uh, regarding API response objects, simple class with public fields or POJO? Simple class with public fields works. Sometimes uh, uh, Java records are working. And um, and uh, I use JSONP right now in my projects because as a POJO, you have the problem, you know, what happens if the field is null or it doesn't exist or shouldn't exist. It's really harder to model with POJO. Okay, Alex uh, says records do require Java 7. I'm st stuck on Java 11. So the, the problem with Alex is, you know, um, he 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 was a long time a Spring developer, and now I don't know what he is doing. So Alex, you should use modern technologies. So um, yeah um, Sokista Sokiskata says um, I hope that Java versions will incorporate easier styles like uh, Lombok. I have to say, mostly what I see in Lombok is 
uh, get a setter and, and public constructor. So I, I have to say, I never use Lombok and I don't miss it. You can you can write simple Java code without Lombok, absolutely. And you have to listen to the episode with Lenny because Lenny Lenny uh, 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 provided some some use, good use cases for Lombok. So why there's Adam Bean here? We went to a 100% Java CDK business and it's a charm. Alex, thank you. So uh, I think Alex attended one of my workshops and he works and uses CDK. So thank you. Um, yeah, for me, it is like huge. If you comp compare it with Terraform, I would say with CDK, we are writing maybe 10% of the code, right? And uh, and yeah. Ah, Alex only uses plain Java. Okay, cool. Very cool. Uh, and you are stuck on Java 11 because AWS is Java 11. So I'm taking back now, Alex. You can use Java 17 layer on Lambda and it is working right now. We are using in current projects. So you can absolutely have Java 17 on AWS Lambda. Search for Java 17 layer. And a gentleman is called Mark Sales. And he created the layer and I'm using the layer and it works perfectly. And you only have to wait until AWS releases Java 17 and they're in game. So cool story, Alex, that you are using uh, Pojos. Yeah, um, reactive programming. I think uh, Project Loom will make uh, portions of reactive programming obsolete where you need, you know, high scalability. So um, I didn't use actually reactive programming at all in my project except for Kafka. And this will remain with Kafka, but uh, I, I would say... Even without reactive programming in my projects, you know, request response is always fast enough. Now, how Project Loom could affect Java E? Does millions of threads make difference? It already affected uh, Java E, uh, Marek, because if you search for Helidon Lima, uh, Nima, and this is part of the podcast, they are, um, so Helidon is similar to Quarkus, and they support uh, parts of Jakarta and MicroProfile. And Nima is completely reactive and they will make it available for MicroProfile. So you won't notice any difference, but it will, you, you can have you know, millions of parallel requests and it will just work. So it is it already happens. So I thought today we will spend 15 minutes with Airhex and it was longer than this. I would say thank you all. I really enjoyed today. No idea why it was a, a you know great audience. Thank you. Gather your questions and see you next month. Bye.